We're here at the 22nd Croix, and my name is Fred Scheich. I'm with IFARA, and we're here with Rick Bushman, who is with University of Pennsylvania, and he's going to give us kind of a background on some of the science, the interesting science in HIV. It's interesting to you, and in a very technical way, and to your colleagues, but what we're trying to do now is to translate that into something that that will be digestible and interesting and have a good experience for people that are in our audience who may not be that well educated. So uh, we hope we can accomplish that. But uh, Rick, we appreciate your being here. And um, can you tell us about some of the, what you hope to, to cover in this short time? Sure. Um, first, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm going to talk about research that, we, that I've been involved with. We've tended to be sort of a technology shop, helping develop methods to do new stuff in HIV research. And that's taken us into a few areas. So let me talk about a couple of areas, one being uh, understanding how HIV grows in order to um, obstruct that and make new drugs. And then another area that's very popular in the last uh, couple of years, which is trying to use new technology to understand the bugs that live associated with the human body and um, how they may change during immunodeficiency, HIV, and other kinds of states. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what I'd like to get across. Okay. Well, uh, cover it in the best way you can. And, and if I have a question that you know maybe is clarative or hopefully uh, explanatory, maybe you can help. Great. So um, what got me into HIV research was um, trying to study one part of the HIV replication cycle, one that um, for which there was, weren't inhibitors uh, in existence, but it seemed like there ought to be. And that was the uh, integration part of the HIV replication cycle. And so I'll take a minute to give you the background, kind of explain that, and uh, then say um, what's involved in making it not work anymore. Mm -hmm. So as probably many of you uh, <coughs> uh, have heard, uh, HIV is a retrovirus. So what that means is um, viral particles have um, one kind of polymer in their little informational polymer in their particles, RNA, and that's converted after an HIV infects a cell, that's converted into DNA by reverse transcriptase. Probably many of you will be familiar with reverse transcriptase inhibitors, which were the first kinds of drugs that were used to treat HIV and first found to be effective. So after that, after the virus introduces RNA and reverse transcription makes a copy of the viral DNA, that DNA integrates or becomes incorporated into the DNA of the cell that it's infecting. That's called the integration step. There's a protein encoded by the virus that does that called integrase. So if this is the viral DNA, if this is a chromosome, it integrates in. And the virus has to do that in order to replicate efficiently. So it's a very interesting system for, for nerds like me to try to understand the mechanisms and things, how it all works. Uh, when we started in on this in 1989, um, you couldn't make it work inside a test tube. <clears throat> so our job was to purify the pieces involved, the viral protein, and uh, synthesize DNAs. And uh, after a great deal of tinkering, we were able to get the reaction to work, where you could take purified components and make that integration reaction work with purified integrase. So that was really cool. That allowed us to learn a lot about how the virus grows, sort of perturbing the test tube reactions. <clears throat> it also provided the point of departure for um, drug screens to try to make it not happen anymore with small molecules. And so I should say this, is, um, <clears throat> this was the effort of a large community. Um, I was working at NIH with Bob Craigie and Kyoshi Mizuuchi. I was a postdoc at the time. Other labs were sort of close on our heels doing similar work. And then once the pharmaceutical industry picked up these assays, uh, it was a gigantic job on their part to improve the assays. Uh, Daria Hazuda led this at Merck. And um, then do lots and lots of screening, endure innumerable setbacks. And finally, 2007, raltegravir was approved as an integrase inhibitor for use in patients. So that's been, that's been a fun kind of research and something that started out as you know, very exploratory, very basic research and evolved to getting drugs in patients after sort of a gigantic effort involving many, many people. And the timeline on that was from, you said, 1989? 89, and then to, to 2007. The, to the Raltegra, which was, I think, mar marked or mentioned by John Mellers as a watershed moment, almost similar to the 1994 uh, protease inhibitors. It was yet another moment in history. So that moment in history took a number of years. Yeah, yeah. Well, 
quick as these things go. I mean, it's, uh, it's sort of shocking how difficult and expensive it is to develop drugs of any kind, but mm -hmm. this one went reasonably well. I mean, mm -hmm. as, as many of you will, will know, the experience with HIV, although difficult, expensive, it really is amazing to see a, a giant scientific community mobilized together with you know the community, everybody, to um, create new drugs, get them implemented, and make it work. I mean, it's really, despite all the difficulties and expense and everything, it's an example of how it all ought to work. David Cooper, I think, was the one that presented that at the press conference and, and in the, at that particular CROI. I think it was Boston. I can't remember for sure. But he was, um, and that was that moment where it seemed like a, a watershed at that point. Yeah, yeah, an amazing breakthrough. I really credit Daria with having the persistence to mm -hmm. make it through really major setbacks uh, mm -hmm. in order to keep the program alive within Merck um, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, come out the other side with an important breakthrough. So scientists such as you are, are really, you obviously have many, many more failures than you have successes. And that's the way you learn. And that's the science. And so you, as a scientist, have to be prepared for that kind of a life. Uh, I mean, some scientists may never have a success story. Is that, is that true? But, you, well, but it's, it's great when you, it's kind of like playing the lottery, I guess, in a way. To some degree. I think um, for drug development specifically, many people in industry will work, on pro will work their whole careers without ever having something, a drug, make it into humans, which is really hard. Mm -hmm. it, would be, it would be great if we could figure out how to do that better. And mm -hmm. it's tough to make it more rewarding mm -hmm. for the people doing the work. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, for a basic researcher, um, it depends. Um, often we, got, we have droughts where we don't get good data for a while, and we're sort of wondering if it's all going to be sustainable or not. Mm -hmm. But other times, things are working all over the place, and mm -hmm. um, that's sort of what keeps you going, I guess. This conference had the, the hepatitis success stories, which are coming, like you said, after one after another and after another. Yep. But I think the, the, the challenge is to, to be able to face those, those uh, set, I don't know what you call it, setbacks. Just, and you know, a setback is a learning experience. I mean, you now know what doesn't work, and you now know that you're not going to do that again. You have your randomized controlled trial that is now um, defined and in your parameters now you know that okay we do this a little differently explain to me a little bit about the peer process because this is what we're doing here at the CROI we're, we're examining it each person at the CROI is almost like another person that's going to say what about this did you really think about this in front of the poster sessions it's very exciting I think it's almost like doing battle here you know they yeah so. Well, it, it has many good, um, <clears throat> many many good dimensions. A few bad ones. Um, the um, it's important to be have sort of open, honest debates. And uh, if there's some defect in your logic, some defect in your experimental uh, execution, it's really important to get that clarified as early as possible in order to not waste a lot of time. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's good. <clears throat> I think the I think many good scientists. Are not. I think it's an important thing to not be too wedded to one idea, mm -hmm. but just very responsive to data. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you have a view of how it's all working, like the HIV replication cycle, where you're trying to add to it as you read and, and learn new stuff and adjust it as you know new data mm -hmm. suggests. Mm -hmm. No, it's not that way. It's this way. And you know, if you're flexible and pay attention and do that over time, it's like you're sort of approaching something. You're you know mm -hmm. you're really starting to see how it might all work. It's, it's pretty easy to get bogged down in an idea that you're sort of emotionally involved in and mm -hmm. lose sight of objectivity. Take I think that big step back and say, what am I really learning here? Is this, you know, am I trying to answer the right question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really important to just, I, I personally like changing my views based on new information. I think mm -hmm. it's sort of stimulating and you, know, you wonder about all the rest of it. And I think that's kind of important and not always the case. Um, but then, I mean, there can be, as with any human endeavor, there can be, you know, interpersonal conflicts and uh, disappointments and anger and all the, all the downside that goes with that as well. But you're working with, in some cases, a group or other colleagues who do you... Now, people think that there is this competitive nature and proprietary to the crazy degree. It really isn't, is it? I mean, you do work with colleagues that may, may also be looking for 
an outcome. Like you said, there's some number of people working on the same program. Some of them are wedded to each other in maybe fiscal ways, others are not. Is that so? Yeah, that's definitely so. Um, uh, with each passing year, there's more of a trend towards large multidisciplinary programs because often to answer a question in today's world, it'll take a bunch of different kinds of technology and it would be unusual for one person to be good at all of that. So groups come together to, to advance um, studies. It's not rare in HIV research for if there's an important question and you're working on it, somebody else may also be doing exactly that and trying to publish ahead of you. But, you know, that that has some pluses in that errors get corrected and people are forced to pay close attention to being efficient and doing it well and stuff like that. And so um, I, I don't think that's bad. It, it can be taken to an extreme that's bad, but I think a little competition's healthy actually. It seems like the poster sessions are the most interactive because you have that personal touch. You're right in front of a poster. You're right there with the person who is either principal or one of the investigators who really is knowledgeable about and can really talk to it and defend their work. Yeah. And uh, when you find a, uh, an oral presentation, two or three questions get asked. It's, and they're not always necessarily the best. I guess, how would you feel about that? I, do you agree that this is the, the posters are the real action moment? It can be, um, you can have energetic debates at a poster and, and that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can, after a talk, um, it's mixed, I agree, but sometimes you get the toughest questions. I think it's good when somebody, I mean, the most valuable colleagues, really, it's painful, but they're, they're the ones who spot the weaknesses in the data, the chain of logic, and put their finger on it and say, well, what about this? What exactly can you say about that? How could mm -hmm. you strengthen this piece? Mm -hmm. It's sort of excruciating, but it's, it also is crucial for figuring out how to do it better. Mm -hmm. So do you often get follow-up uh, contact from a scientist that just didn't, have time to connect with you at the kind of make that made a note and said he I have some data here that kind of refutes what you're saying uh, not that often I just refuted what you said but um, sure at this meeting and other meetings there's commonly contacts and lots of discussion about data and sometimes some um, from people you didn't have a chance to talk to or mm -hmm. talk to long enough mm -hmm. Let me tell you about um, the topic of integration and inhibitors. Uh, there's a whole new class that um, is, is looking pretty exciting, very early stage development, but people might want to learn about that if you mm -hmm. think that would yeah, be good. Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, so remember I said that the, imagine this is the viral DNA and it's bound to viral proteins and here's a, this will be a human chromosome and it carries out integration. Mm -hmm. So the inhibitors, um, raltegravir and others, they bind right there Mm -hmm. and they block the uh, target capture and strand transfer step. Mm -hmm. So they're strand transfer inhibitors, and you know they've been in patients since 2007. They work really well. Now, there are other spots on integrase, on this pro protein that's important for this reaction, that people have found that can bind small molecules. Mm -hmm. So we've helped a little with this, but it, there's another large effort in the drug companies. And um, they seem to bind, they seem to compete for binding with a cellular cofactor. So we showed a few years ago that HIV doesn't integrate just anywhere in chromosomes. It, it actually prefers to integrate inside um, genes. Uh, and that's probably because it, it can make more copies of itself more efficiently if it integrates in a certain part of chromosomes instead of just anywhere. And the way that happens is a tethering reaction mm. where this kind of integration complex with viral integrase bound at the, at the tips mm -hmm. can, bi can bind a cellular protein and that carries out integration in a specific location as a result, sort of tethering mm -hmm. reaction. Mm -hmm. So there have been inhibitors made that bind and block this tethering interaction. Mm -hmm. uh, and those are working quite well in cell culture, and uh, there are a bunch of different ones now in different companies. And people are sort of gearing up, trying to find ones that have desirable properties inside people. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, animal studies, toxicity, all of that. And it's actually looking sort of promising. It's, the mechanism has been surprising. You might have thought, well, it, it, people put these compounds um, on cells where HIV is growing and show it doesn't grow anymore, and that's great. Mm -hmm. But it turns out it's not acting by inhibiting this integration reaction. It's, it's, um, HIV, it's, it's, it's messing up another part of the viral replication cycle. After virus makes proteins, makes copies of its uh, RNA, it has to bud out of the cell to make a particle and then infect. 
And what happens with these inhibitors is when you butt out and make particles, they don't work anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's binding to integrase in a different context and doing something else. Is this something you didn't expect or that it was? It was very unexpected. So yeah. your, the method or the action was really different than you supposed. Yep. They, they bind the site that people thought it was going to bind. Mm -hmm. They um, inhibit night virus quite well in cell culture, but using a mechanism that is entirely unexpected. So and this actually functionally would be more solid than the, than presumably than the other with the tethering. Is that true? Or? Yeah, yeah. Well, the, it certainly seems to be what the yeah. compounds do. When they mess up viruses, they make particles that don't work anymore after mm -hmm. they come out of, but out of cells. Mm -hmm. So a very interesting research area. We and lots of people are trying to figure out more about how these work and mm -hmm. what's going to be needed to try to move these programs forward. Mm -hmm. My group's been working with GSK on this, but a bunch of different companies are working with a bunch of different people in the mm -hmm. field. Mm -hmm. It's exciting. I, I, I mean, just being able to explain it without a big diagram and a chalkboard and everything else, but uh, I think it's, um, it's interesting, and we might be following that. Uh, people can dig up on the internet maybe what, 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 what would be the key words they would search for that. Uh, well, it's somewhat difficult because the... It's, um, it's not the, there yet for well, mainstream or... It's more that all each of the different groups working on this has their own name for it. Ah, okay, that's <laughs> so, what I was getting at. Al allosteric integrase inhibitors. Allosterism, or, that, was, uh, that was the Glaxo thing, wasn't it? Uh, uh, or, yeah, uh, well, maybe. I remember that with certain other products they had called it allosterism, yeah. Okay, and then there was um, another group called them Legends. This tethering protein's named LEDGF, so Legends as the uh, inhibitor class, and, and there are others too. So yeah. it's uh, so look up Legends on the internet if you want to get started in this area. Okay. Well, anything else that you can bring to the table, or or do we expound on everything that you needed to? Well, uh, it's, I mean, I, I was appreciative of you giving the backstory on your your views on certain things around the science and, the, and the, the peer review process is very important, I think. Yeah, yeah. Would you like me to say a little bit about the human microbiome and HIV? Yeah, we have a few minutes left. That's, uh, let's do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, in the last few years, it's become clear that, um, it was sort of known before, but greatly clarified with new technology, just how many uh, bacteria and other kinds of bugs live associated with the human body. Mm -hmm. So for people with uh, experience with HIV and uh, immunodeficiency, you'll know, of course, that um, as the immune system fails, um, uh, there can be um, overgrowth of bugs that normally are pretty benign. They can be bad in uh, immunodeficient conditions. Uh, your body harbors enormous numbers of bugs uh, normally. There's, in fact, there are more bacterial cells living associated with your body than there are human cells associated with your body. We're talking like parasites and... Uh, no, like yeah. the, the uh, bacteria in your gut. They help you digest your food. They, so they're um, good and bad. Yeah, yeah. And many are good. They, mm -hmm. they, the ones in your gut help digest your food. They help your immune system grow properly. They help shoulder out pathogens by occupying space. Um, and there are more of them in us than us, really. It's, it's mm -hmm. quite remarkable. So um, in HIV research, people have begun looking at the sort of shifting patterns of communities associated with incrementally greater states of immune deficiency. Mm -hmm. There's starting to be some pretty interesting data coming out um, uh, suggesting that even um, in people who are well-treated and pretty healthy, there can be uh, detectable changes. And, people are just starting to try to assess the significance. Mm -hmm. So for example, there was a, a large consortium, the Lung Human Microbiome Program, studying lung and uh, HIV infection. Mm -hmm. And there we found um, a certain bacteria, a pathogen, was actually more represented in lungs of uh, HIV positive people, even though they were healthy and doing well mm -hmm. on their medications. Mm -hmm. uh, wh uh, Trophorema whippoli, the Whipple's disease bug, which is sort of puzzling. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not clear if it's important, but that's just an example of sort of finding novelty associated with disease. Another place where this kind of, uh, where the human microbiome impinges on HIV research is in drug metabolism. Mm -hmm. It's clear that um, the, the bugs in your gut and elsewhere in your, uh, associated with your body can contribute a lot of metabolic capacity. They can um, be effective at uh, helping process drugs, for example, inactivate drugs. 
uh, we and others have seen um, alterations in drug metabolism in mice, depending on whether they do or don't have micro microbiota associated. And so people are just beginning to investigate for important drugs like the HIV drugs. If you have different uh, bugs in your gut, are you differentially processing the drugs? Does it uh, dictate the degree of drug exposure? If there's some change in your gut microbiome, will your drugs affect you differently? And so these are all uh, very new kinds of questions that... Because um, a lot of times they do uh, drug testing in healthy volunteers. Mm -hmm. So that may be a real issue. It could be, yeah. yep. And one of the conclusions from the Human Microbiome Project, this giant program, um, uh, we, we were part of at Penn um, to study the bugs associated with people is that people tend to be really different from each other. The yeah. bugs inhabiting your gut mm -hmm. and elsewhere differ between individuals. And mm -hmm. so if those bugs differ in their capacity to metabolize drugs, then that could be a pretty important piece of why people respond differently to drugs. Mm -hmm. And so this is an area that's just sort of beginning to get studied and, and very uh, exciting. And a lot of pharma companies, well, all pharma companies would like to have one size fits all mm -hmm. and one drug fits all. So uh, that can be challenging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, this is a, it's sort of like discovering Mars or something. There's, there's so many bugs associated mm -hmm. with your body. And we can see them now in a way we couldn't before, thanks to the new DNA sequencing methods. Mm -hmm. um, many of you will probably have heard that we can now collect vast amounts of DNA sequence uh, conveniently using new technologies. It's just incredible. Mm -hmm. And so we can take a sample of human gut contents or oral swab or whatever, purify DNA, sequence it, and then align those sequences to a database and read out the kinds of bugs that are there. Mm -hmm. So we now have like a new microscope for um, mm -hmm. reading out bugs conveniently, and so we can begin to ask these questions in a way we couldn't before. Do you, th do you suppose this kind of research or knowledge or lab values and so forth can be helpful in C. difficile because that's become so complicated these days? Yeah, well, that's kind of the poster child for this area in some ways mm -hmm. because stool transplant is highly effective. Yeah. It's uh, amazing that I was seeing that. That's just totally yeah, mind-boggling. It's, it's like 90% curative. Mm -hmm. So for any of you who don't follow this, um, if you're uh, taking antibiotics, in particular if you're elderly, maybe hospitalized, you're at risk of being colonized with a very nasty bacteria called mm -hmm. Clostridia difficile, which can cause uh, severe gut problems. It's often fatal even in the elderly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so if something, so if you take antibiotics, that clears out the bacteria that are normally there and creates an opportunity for something bad to come in and live there. But if you take stool from a healthy person, gut bugs that are uh, healthy and supposed to be there, and you take really a lot of them, you can uh, re reprogram the Repopulate. community. Yeah, it's just amazing. I mean, people. it's so simple. It's so logical <laughs> that it just. You know, why didn't we do it a lot more earlier? You know, yeah. but, but especially now when it becomes almost impossible to get off of the antibiotics. So this is a much easier route to go. Yeah, and there's a new wave of technology coming there where people in, are looking for cocktails of bacteria that instead of stool, you'll use uh, purified bacteria. Mm -hmm. You compose them to make a nice, healthy community, get a whole bunch of different kinds and put mm -hmm. them together and use something that you've grown in sort of a careful way and can quality control and so on instead of raw human poop. Right. We could, we could talk for days on this, I tell you, but we're going to have to end it because you have to go on to the sessions. Rick, thank you so much for being here and for doing this, and I hope we can invite you back for another experience, put some more, more items of science interest on the table. Well, thank you very much. It's been thank, a pleasure. Thank you.